Okay, tonight's uh, presentation is uh, IPv6 for Home Networking with Dan Haggerty. And I'd like to introduce Hag. Also, after the meeting, we'll go to the Cambridge Brewing Company. Right now, we've only got three people that have said they were going, but we'll check later after Hag is finished. Thank you. Okay, it's all yours. I do. So as you guys heard, my name is Daniel Haggerty. Um, I've been kind of working with IPv6 for a really long time now, um, where basically I set up uh, MIT once upon a time in 1999, kind of on a lark, where basically what you could do with IPv6 was ping things over IPv6. At that point, I moved on. Um, in 2007, it was starting to look a little bit more interesting and useful, so I started playing with it at my house. Used a couple of different known tunneling technologies to get out of my house. Uh, a few years later, I ended up provisioning uh, one of the local bandwidth uh, cooperatives with uh, with their uh, BGP based setup, and which was real native IPv6. And uh, I'm now starting in on my employer, um, where that's mostly something I'm doing so I can reach my house. They don't as yet have any business need for it, but uh, that's starting to change now. Um, so when I got here uh, a little while ago, I went and played with Hurricane Electric, which uh, is one of the canonical tunnel providers for uh, getting IPv6 connectivity when you can't just get the ISP at your house to do it for you. Um, and I use these guys at home. They're also very usable here. Um, tunnel creation is pretty simple and straightforward. Pretty much give them my address, tell them where I want my tunnel connected to, do a little bit on the uh, host side, where uh, really just the top part was the important thing for this laptop. It's not running any kind of firewall at the moment. Um, you create a tunnel. Uh, you ask for the tunnel to be connected on one end to yourself and on the other to something far away. Um, and then you give it IPv6 addresses. Um, and with luck, it should still work. So that's pretty much, you know, the uh, at least beginning of it for your own house. Now, in the broader picture, you're probably already running IPv6. This was a quick sna uh, snapshot I took of my employer's network uh, earlier this afternoon, where there's no expressly configured IPv6 like that. I just asked, ping everything that is IPv6 connected, which is the address that is being used there. Um, and as you can see, I got 22 answers. You can have a little laser clean. So as you can see, 22 machines on the network decided to an answer back. I know that some of them aren't just Linux machines, there are printers, Windows boxes, what have you. Things are moving forward. Um, at work, we recently had an oops where we had a power controller box that had been connected to the network, had several essential machines connected to it, and somehow no IPv4 network configured. Or at least it had one, but nobody could figure out what it was. It wasn't set to the one it was supposed to do. But our switch said it was alive could tell, show me something that had a Mac on that port. Um, and as luck had it, I was able to easily figure out, oh, it speaks IPv6, I could log in, fix the address misconfiguration for uh, v4, move on. We were very worried that the general reset procedure for the box was uh, going to be a bit destructive considering that it had things like our production databases on it. And this was just, you know, a small maintenance window. So in 2010, I gave a talk kind of like this downstairs, um, and a lot of things have changed since then, where things seem to be rolling along, where there is more adoption now than there was. In 2010, you had to be on a special magic whitelist that Google maintained to use Google over IPv6. These days, you just talk to them, and if you have v6, you'll use it. The same goes for Netflix, Yahoo, Facebook, Akamai, Wikipedia, a lot more. I'm getting more traffic at home, some days I've had 50% of my traffic and more coming over v6, mostly because of YouTube. I've also watched Netflix over v6. It wasn't something where I was looking, let's watch something over IPv6. It was simply, I started watching Netflix and a little while later noticed, oh, um, Comcast is deploying to customers. They have over 50% of their network uh, ready to go with nothing more than a cable modem replacement. Uh, they're working on business customers. As a business customer, well, I ain't there yet. 
Um, <clears throat> Time Warner is doing the same. Uh, T-Mobile has 100% coverage on their network. Um, you have to ask for it, but uh, they are actually uh, doing something quite audacious in that they are running v6 only. Once you are using their v6 service, there's a, no IPv4 on that. You actually use uh, NAT technologies to get to the IPv4 internet over a T-Mobile phone. Um, Verizon over LTE, LTE is using it in some places. Probably more. I wasn't going to, you know, walk all the way through everybody because there are a lot of people doing it at this point. And North America is generally kind of behind. Um, so the generic v6 algorithm is you get IPv6 to your border somehow. Native is preferable, but you know, in many cases you will have to use a tunnel if you're going to decide to do it at all. Um, and then from there you start kind of pushing it into your network. Um, your number of internal interfaces. Um, you have various means of dealing with your uh, internal hosts. You put things in DNS. Uh, one of the things that I did was use mail as the first thing I uh, tested with the public internet simply because it's rather robust and you'll notice pretty quickly with fit, uh, failures and things will retry back to v4 if v6 somehow doesn't work. What's spam like over v6? <laughs> Say again? What is spam like over v6? Does anybody <laughs> try to connect to you? Yes, I get plenty of spam over v6 right. at this point. The yeah. message is no, longer. Yep, that's been about all it amounts to. Now, uh, as an example of why one particular organization is very eager for v6, Comcast, they have uh, 18 million private addresses to work with in RFC 1918. They have about 100 million addresses uh, that they need to be able to reach just in their television product. They have other product lines, they have to have a network to connect all of this stuff. Um, many other large companies are running into the same problem of they just have too much stuff for V4. Oh, this is for the programmers in the audience. If there are any, I'll skip them now, unless you want me to, or don't want me to. Don't skip them? Don't skip them. Okay. For me. Okay. All so, people may not want <laughs> but one of the ways I like to do this talk, <coughs> such that I've done it only a couple times, is it's best to, uh, to ask me questions and steer me around. Tell me what you want to hear. I can answer a lot of things in this because I've been playing with it for a long time. I'm not always going to come up with the right slides for you, but we'll see what I can do. Um, so, programming doesn't change all that vastly. At the lowest level, you've got the same old routine, <coughs> socket, bind, accept. They're just using a different address family um, and feeding them different socket, uh, socket address structures to describe what do you want to do. Um, there is a new multi-protocol thread safe uh, host and address resolution routines that replace get host by name and get host by adder. Um, these things are uh, a little bit more capable and uh, more general. Oh, and one big thing that tends to change with uh, v6, at least if you're going to deal with v4 and v6, is it's strongly recommended to make your program capable of dealing with multiple sockets. Um, while there are, there are means of having what basically amounts to v6 delivered over v4, People are trying to push you away from that at this point because, well, there have been a few security advisories involving it. Mostly because you get uh, your application gets ACL processing wrong and it's just easier to make mistakes. This is what get adder info as a command line tool on FreeBSD looks like. You ask it for things like, I want to talk to Google, port 80, over TCP. It gives you an answer of things that are how you should talk to it. Um, you'll see a bunch of IPv4 addresses at an IPv6 address in this case. And on this system, it really is telling you, try them in this order. Um, your system may vary as far as what it wants to do. Um, this is an extract of a server I wrote in Perl at some point. Um, there are APIs that for high level languages make it pretty straightforward to deal with. Um, you basically just uh, end up creating two sockets and running a select loop over them. The actual how you create things not too unobvious. Naturally, you're going to have to try it a bit. But, um, this is an old slide from 2010, where the only thing that's really important on it, and I couldn't figure out where to put the bullet item, is I run IPv6 at my house. My wife, while she's technical, has no patience for debugging things. Uh, she wants her network to work, not think about it at all. And well, that's what she gets. 
she really doesn't notice the fact that I'm running IPv6 and that uh, her machine will go and use it when it thinks it's a good idea. So IPv4 is mostly, or IPv6 is mostly IPv4 with a bigger address. There are some things that change, and this is one of the annoying things about IPv6. There were proposals that really did literally amount to just give it bigger addresses and change absolutely nothing else. This is not what we got. Some of these things might be features in the long run, but it's kind of annoying when you just want to get it to work. Um, some of the things that have changed include link local addresses. Multicast is now very extensively used to try and reduce the load on LAN hosts that are not involved in conversations. Things like uh, the way address discovery works now will try and trim out machines that aren't interested in what you're asking. Um, there's yeah, one of the biggest objectives of the original IPv6 was to help to unload mm -hmm. the routers. They still have to talk a lot because they're the routers. But still, yeah. there are a lot of things, and really, the multicast usage is very clever. Um, there is hardware in uh, things like Ethernet and a lot of other canonical linked uh, technologies for allowing you to scope who should pay attention. Um, Whereas in IPv4, lots of things were just, well, ask everybody. Um, so there's now a uh, address auto configuration. There is a very different way of, uh, of how hosts find their routers. It's not anything like DHCP. This sometimes works out as a bug, but we'll see where it goes. Right now we are in the state where you can choose which one you want. Give or take, does your platform support that? Um, unlike uh, IPv4, multiple addresses on a given interface are pretty much standard. If nothing else, a normally numbered address is going to have at least two, um, and more is quite common. Um, and this isn't a complete list, of course, but you know, only somewhat from one slide. Um, the addresses, as you can see, are a lot bigger. That address there is a fully expanded no compression uh, as far as uh, trying to get rid of anything you don't need. Whereas uh, the lower one has been compressed a little bit, but is nonetheless an example of an actual address on my uh, home network, which it's a bit of a mouthful. And believe it or not, you do actually, even just as you often tend to do in v4, tend to end up memorizing at least pieces of v6 addresses. Like the, uh, this part you tend not to notice, because that's basically a MAC address for the machine. But uh, the leading part, you'll have that down after a while. Or at least I tend to. It's a little annoying because like, I have an address that uh, I stopped using two years ago, the entire prefix. Um, I still remember it. It's not like it was memorable. Um, so this is, uh, these are the rules for how you can take a fully expanded address and compress it down to something a little smaller. You'll see that some addresses do work out a lot smaller, and often if you're configuring a network by hand where uh, uh, readability of addresses is important, readability and memorability of the addresses is important, you're very likely to actually do things like the short one. Um, there's an IPv4, there's a notation where you can embed IPv4 uh, in the end of addresses. It's not very recommended at this point because unfortunately, even if you can feed it, feed some routine on the system, the IPv4 format, it's likely to come back to you sometime later in that format. You know, you'll read netstat, things like that. They're not going to help you with uh, a used v4 address. Is what it is. Um, so these are some of the canonical prefixes you'll see in IPv6 and uh, the approximate equivalent that uh, you'll see in v4, things like the INAT or any loop back, uh, RIFC 19 space, um, multicast addresses. Now address allocation. This has been long and silly and I won't go into the details of how we got here, but these days the general feeling is if you are warm and breathing, we will give you at least a slash 48 uh, addresses. That's two and a half IPv4 internets uh, inside of that prefix. Now, because of the way IPv6 uh, is working out, you are being strongly pushed to really have 65,000 uh, subnets 
And that's one of the ways to tend, you tend to think about v6 after a little bit, is it's less about posts, it's more about how many subnets do I have. There's been some preference for making things easier for people in allocation by nibble aligning uh, the delegations so that uh, when you split a prefix, you don't deal with the stuff in v4 that you often do, where uh, addresses are kind of clumsy to split. Uh, instead, you just tend to see that spot right there in between the A and the F, right there. That's you. Um, uh, people are a bit worried about uh, exhausting how much of the uh, v6 space we have, given what happened with v4. Um, there are 281 trillion slash 48s available. Um, and basically, there is a particular prefix we are using now for what we allocate public addresses from. Uh, you can see the math there, that it works out that uh, we get several thousand per person on a 17 uh, billion person planet. And that's just part of the address space. Um, I'm guessing that whatever problems we've run into, running out of address space per se isn't going to be it. Um, and it's probably going to take a bit. I probably will be long since retired. Um, so this is basically where we are allocating from now. We have uh, 2000 slash 3, which is everybody. The six bone appeared in there long, long ago. We still have plenty of space in it that we're allocating, you know, 20 years later. Um, like that was the six bone prefix way back when. Um, and you can see that we have several prefixes uh, about the same size as the 2001 that we're not using. And by the time we get there, there's going to be a serious reckoning of, well, how did we use this? What did we do wrong? What does documentation prefix mean? There is a prefix in IPv4, just like in, uh, well, in IPv6 and IPv4, which is the use this as a random example in your documentation. Um, there's more room, of course, in v6, so it's a little easier to use. They were often a little tight to use, such that you'd use other things in v4 documentation. So, if you've ever plugged, like, say, a laptop like this, a Microsoft box, I don't think Linux does this one by default, um, into something like a switch with nothing connected, if you sit there a minute, will eventually make up an address on 169254 for itself. You can actually even make uh, good use of this in some situations where you can plug two laptops in together and just uh, communicate without having to do any planning whatsoever. Uh, some people's software actually uses it. I know Apple has uh, made use of it before. You don't need a switch. Most Ethernet ports will automatically talk to other Ethernet ports without a switch. Oh, sure, sure. This was just a case of uh, I've even tested it as just plug it into a network with nothing there. It needs to see the link up to go do it. But, uh, but once there's a link up, it will eventually go make one up. That's one of the downsides of it in IPv4 is because the algorithm is fairly conservative in assuming that it has to work hard to prove that address really doesn't seem to be in use. Um, it takes 60 seconds, whereas the IPv6 version, you plug it in, it's there immediately. Um, every single IPv6 interface tends to have one. You can remove them if you want. Sometimes you run into situations where you do, just because, well, I really don't want to talk to somebody on that interface. Things like uh, slow peering situations, stuff like that, where you just don't want that. Um, now, uh, these addresses are what are called link scoped, um, which you could run into in v4, too. It was just a lot hairier to deal with. The essential property that link scope things have is that there is, by definition, overlap in the addressing. So, for instance, you can have a host dot one on one network that on a different wire is also done, that has a different host name dot one on a different wire, and you still need to be able to talk to both of them, and you can. Um, and just one place you'll often see them is routing protocols. They like to uh, use them as the next hop because, well. It's not going away in typical situations, whereas technically the other prefix can go away. So IPv6 pretty much ditches multicast, or ditches the broadcast, sorry. Um, they've substituted it with fairly equivalent multicast. Um, it translates a little cleaner on the link layer, for instance, when you uh, 
ping the all IPv6 hosts address on a wire, only IPv6 hosts see it. If you have netware hosts on there or something like that, they're not, their uh, Ethernet cards aren't even going to pick it up. Because they're not listening to that multicast. Um, and just like uh, multicast, they have the same property of uh, there can be multiple interfaces where that address means different things. If I talk out my F0, um, to say all hosts, that's different from talking out my F1 to say all hosts. Um, there were things in IPv4 for how you dealt with that, like uh, ping has, uh, depending on your operating system, a dash I or dash S uh, for saying, I want you to use this interface for talking multicast. But now there's actually systematic support for it. Um, there is a scoping concept in the multicast just to say how far do you want this multicast to go. Multicast was always problematic in IPv4 <coughs> for that. I'm not really counting on it being any better on IPv6. A lot of the problems with scoping were really human issues of misconfiguring your router. Um, and so outside of the one that is, this doesn't leave this particular wire, I'm not counting on that one working very hard, but we'll see where it goes. <coughs> so this is what link scoping looks like. Um, you uh, take an address. You append a percent, then you use some kind of interface name where exactly uh, what OS you're running drives what is that interface name going to be. Um, most of the systems I've dealt with, you know, F0, FXP0, things like that, Windows uses integers. Uh, a little hard to figure out which integer is which, but as I recall, IP, IP config will tell you. So IPv6 has auto configuration uh, pretty much out of the box. Um, routers basically sit there periodically beaconing to everything on the wire saying, hi, I'm a router. I'll take your traffic. Here are, here's how you build an address for yourself. Uh, this is, once again, not DHCP. Resembles uh, things like Apple Talk and Movell Network a bit more. Um, the main thing that it uses to that hosts use to build an address for themselves is the prefix that the router gave them and whatever their MAC address was, which is actually a 64-bit quantity in IPv6 because, uh, well, the, uh, the IEEE has kind of noticed that we're starting to run out of MAC addresses and has started pushing towards to use a 64-bit one, please. Uh, Ethernet's probably never going to change. But FireWire, for instance, was specified to use the 64-bit one out of the box. So the IETF went along with, okay, we're going to use the 64-bit one. Um, there's a trick for turning uh, Ethernet Max into a uh, 64-bit quantity. It's uh, not something it, the IETF invented. It's actually uh, the IEEE's. Um, but you'll notice, if you see a lot of uh, host addresses going by in IPv6, they tend to have FFFE in them. Oh, and uh, that's an important point. Um, so one big problem with the auto configuration in IPv6 is that it only at, works with 64-bit uh, with, with long subnets, which some people don't like. If nothing else, it seems to burn an awful lot of addressing, and, uh, well, it's the sort of thing that makes people who have been around for a long time a little nervous. Um, I don't know how I feel about it myself, so I don't know what to tell you. It's pretty much what it is right now. Question? This is another problem with auto configuration is privacy, or our expectations of privacy. That is, today, on most V4 networks, that at least I've used, you get a, a, a private address, you know, 192 or uh, you know, 10 or something. And there's an app box sitting in front of it. And if I'm accessing a website, it looks like my IP address is the router's IP address, MIT's network being a notable exception. Mm -hmm. that we with IPv6, that sort of goes out the door, right? Because if you're going to take my Ethernet Mac and you construct my address from that, then I may think I'm behind a router and private, but I effectively have a public, publicly routable IP address that is tied to the specific physical machine that I'm sitting in. 
So there is actually, uh, has been some thought on this one, and there's a standard uh, extension that you'll see on a lot of things. I know the Macs do it, the Windows machines do it. Well, actually, pretty much everything will do it. Uh, the only question is whether it's a default or not. So on modern Mac OS and on modern Windows, um, they default to uh, the, using the privacy extension, where because you have so many bits to play with uh, on numbering yourself, they'll periodically invent new addresses for themselves. Um, sure, you still have that one based on your MAC address, but it's probably not going to use that for most circumstances. And there's some tuning that the OS allows you to do as far as saying, do I use this privacy address that's going to be here for the next day? Do I use my real address? Um, one problem that this uh, whole approach has is, so take my home network. I have a slash 48 prefix from Hurricane Electric. That, bit, that part is fixed. I have uh, 16 bits that uh, specifically identify individual subnets within my house, all two of them. Um, and then I have these privacy addresses that uh, have 64 bits worth of ability to churn themselves. So I can churn the 64 bits, but there are two people and a couple of cats in my house. I'm not really getting a lot of entropy. Um, you know, I can blend in with my wife, but that's not a lot of blending in. Mm -hmm. Fixing the broader problem of uh, that prefix being pretty fixed, that's harder. I don't know where they're going to go with that. Um, the only thing I can think of, of course, is, well, we have so many slash 48s to burn through. We'll see what happens. But at least with what you said in that uh, segment right there, it, it, if I take my laptop, <coughs> go to a library, and then talk to the library's network and use that to talk to the internet, you can't take that traffic and then identify my laptop with that traffic. As you say. As long as I've configured it right. Well, it tends to be out of the box for a lot of uh, systems. Maybe not yours, I don't know. But yeah, um, it will definitely make it harder to identify uh, you based on that last 64 bits, even with the prefix changing. Um, something else in there, but uh, it's fallen out of my head at the moment. Um, I, I've set up v6 at, at home, and one big problem I ran into with auto configuration was DNS. So mm -hmm. my, you know, I set up um, RAV-D or some daemon on my Linux box, and magically I had v6, and it didn't, I didn't even think about it. Mm -hmm. And I could ping, but I couldn't look anything up. And it seemed really strange that, in my mind as, you know, just a whole network manager, I was thinking I can replace DHCP, um, the DHCP daemon with this um, auto configuration daemon for IPv6, and that wasn't the case. So do I presume your DHCP daemon is dealing with DNS registration for you? That's right, yeah. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I don't know if there are any uh, route advertisement daemons that have uh, covered that case yet. Um, I think there was an extension to IGMP that does it, but it's more recent and it's not widely implemented. Haven't seen it. Uh, but you can almost always just take your router gateway and use it as the DNS. Right, that, that's what I, I have my machine yeah. set up. I think, I think it should be out of the box. So. Yeah, I mean, in practice, I statically configure reverse DNS for all of my stuff anyway. It's just a, I've been around long enough that I can remember when DHCP wouldn't do that for me, and I still feel more comfortable doing it by hand. Thank you very much. But yes, I'm being a bit of a light. I mean, it was it was more of the recursive DNS that I was concerned about. Oh, 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 oh. Right? So okay. That is, I, I wanted to turn off V4. Yes, and gotcha. I did, did not turn off V4 because the one advantage, the one thing I still have from V4 is the DNS server. So all the DNS on my network is over V4 only because I get a friend can come over, open their laptop, and have it work, right? And I could not find a way to turn off V4 and still have that work. And it was because of DNS, I'm wondering if you want. Well, so yes, so uh, this is one of the serious ivory tower problems uh, that V6 has delivered to us, where some things weren't thought about at all. Um, so in the specific case of route advertisements and DNS, there is a fairly recent extension, as you mentioned, that, uh, that provides DNS information over route advertisements. 
Also, DHCP v6 is, of course, quite happy to hand it out. But uh, as far as route advertisements go, that's just one thing that route advertisements forgot to do. There are probably going to be more. Um, and while the t uh, protocol is extensible, <sighs> they're already there in DHCP v6. My understanding of maybe the implied question of like why they didn't think of that mm -hmm. is I think DNS handouts over DHCP, it might be slightly controversial in the first place uh, due to security implications. Um, and they kind of just didn't carry the whole practice forward. Um, and they didn't really solve the problem. But some people thought it was an existing that DHCP allocations of DNS configuration was a problem in the first place. And they didn't want to do it. The big problem to me is that there isn't an easy to remember IPv6 open recursive DNS server with a convenient, you know, 4.2.2.1. If I, uh, there's some um, open DNS has. I know, but it's like, it's like 10 characters. <laughs> I, I don't never, remember it. <laughs> I've never really taken it apart, um, but I do know that in some situations, Microsoft machines will use a v6 anycast address to talk to DNS. So uh, something like FEC zero, but not actually a lot of Google. It's a pretty short one. I just have to go look at my DNS configuration because I did actually turn it on at some point when I figured, oh, that's what you want. Sure, have it. Anyway, any other questions while we're here? Why? I guess this, this sounds very simple, but today, when I set up a server, I give it a static. IP address. Mm -hmm. And this whole IPv6 world seems very different. Well, you get multiple addresses for each machine. They seem to be at the whim of auto configuration. And so, what's the practical answer to the equivalent of the static IP? Turn, I'll, you can turn a lot of this stuff off. There are, uh, I configure my static addresses in addition to. Uh, Mm -hmm. to the auto configuration ones just because the auto configuration ones tend to have a little bit of use to them if only for discovery purposes but I do also on uh, several of my machines have addresses that are you know prefix colon colon one just because that's easy for me to remember when you know things have gone kind of pear-shaped and and in Linux terms where where do you put that well, that's going to depend on your distro, as I recall, uh, but uh, Debian derivatives uh, would probably be Etsy network interfaces. Uh -huh. Oh, so it's in the same files that I would have used for IPv4. I yeah. believe so. Yeah. Um, I haven't done that particular one recently, so it's fallen out. Um, but I'm pretty sure, at least on Debian, it's in the interfaces file and just another, uh, another sort of family clause. Mm -hmm. Sure. So let's see if I ever have already covered any of this. Um, so with route advertisements, this is sort of the not DHCP how you find uh, routers on your network. Routers sit there beaconing periodically, hey, I'm a router, here are some prefixes. Configure yourselves off. <coughs> it, the router can also say things like, I'm a router, I'm not telling you any prefixes, go use DHCP v6. Um, I haven't particularly played with DHCP v6 as yet for reasons I'll get into later. Um, and uh, clients can also uh, explicitly ask, hey, where are the routers around here? And the routers will answer. Um, kind of like DHCP, one of the problems you can run into on a bigger network is uh, if somebody misconfigures a DHCP server on your network um, so that uh, there's like an unauthorized DHCP server, this can cause you a bad day. Although it has the nice property of it's a rolling failure, where as uh, clients start renewing their lease, maybe they end up talking to the bad DHCP server, get a bad information, user notices, hopefully walks up to you just one, and says, something's wrong, can you fix it? And you end up tracking that down. Um, now, the way it works in IPv6's version of this, if uh, somebody starts sending rogue advertisements that I'm a router when they're not, everybody on the network listens instantaneously. This isn't a very good day if, uh, if you're IT at that place. Um, although, much like before, there are features starting to come out at the level of switches that you buy 
that can do things like introspect the traffic going by and say, oh, you're not a router, I know that, I'm not forwarding that, drop it on the floor, just like with DHCP. But um, that's still all kind of bloody. I mean, you can pay several thousand dollars to get a switch like that, the $150 switch I have at home, I don't think it does it. So there is a DHCP v6. Um, it's fairly late to the party for really annoying reasons. If you look at the uh, RIFC publication dates, IPv6 was well underway in 1995. DHCP was only finalized in 1994. For some reason, they just didn't. Uh, the folks involved didn't go to the same parties. There was some religion involved as far as how it should be done. Uh, religion kind of won over pragmatism. Now at this point, uh, DHCP v6 seems to be rolling along a bit more. The support is spotty comment there is a little out of date perhaps. Um, any Microsoft OS of you know recent vintage does it. Supposedly this laptop does it. I haven't tried it at home yet. Certainly any of my free OSs will do it with uh, perhaps the addition of a third party DHCP client. Um, but as yet, I just haven't had any reason to really play with it at home. Is there a question there? Um, yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, the, uh, the yeah, holiday system. Oh, that's quite possible. <laughs> Certainly not going to fix that now. <laughs> um, so this just seemed to fall in with, uh, with the DHCP slide, even though sometimes it's later. Um, there is this cool concept, uh, which has probably helped pushing DHCP a, uh, a bit, uh, DHCP v6, that is, uh, called prefix delegation where a client can basically ask uh, its DHCP server, hey, I'm actually a router. There's some stuff behind me. I need to number these, uh, these network interfaces. Can you give me some address space? And it says, here, have some address space. Carve it up however you need it. <sighs> and supposedly, this is actually working. There are ISPs that are looking at using uh, the technology between themselves and the CPEs that they hand to customers as how they give the customer the address space they use, and maybe even how they renumber the address space that they give to customers if it, come, if it uh, comes to that. Haven't used it. Okay, so that raises the question today. At home, I've got my $150 router. How does it get its address range to serve up to me? Static configuration in many cases. Somebody actually logs into the router, plunks a number into it, and you better hope they don't typo it. Well, I've tried that, and it says, you know, we support IPv6 in many different modes. Oh, v6. But it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have any field for me to put anything like that, so how does it discover? Well, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure, given the, I know the CPE field for IPv6 right now is incredible blood in the water. It's one of the biggest uh, stumbling blocks for ISPs doing deployment is finding a platform that does it, no really does it, no really, really, really does it, and you know, reliably and such that you can deploy it to 10 billion people. Well, I guess I hadn't thought it's, it's probably in the modem then, the cable modem. Yeah, I put there somehow. I pretty much have to see it and uh, fiddle with it to get a sense myself of. Uh, what you're saying. Do you mean like you have Comcast or something and you know that you've been delegated a prefix by the ISP? At my Already? house, yeah. Oh. How, does, how does Comcast give me my address space in my house? Uh, well, they might be, I think Comcast specifically does use DHCP v6, but they also have these uh, very complicated other protocols for distributing, like they can change the password on your cable modem remotely using their magic. Protocol, or I think they can use SNMP. They could so, use SNMP. So just as a personal data point, it looks like you are getting uh, IPv6 from Comcast. I guess, yeah. Good to hear. I mean, I've I've certainly seen them say that they're doing it, and seen you know people out there on the internet saying, yeah, I've got it. But uh, you might be the first person I've seen in person. Oh, well, I don't have it yet. I'm well, trying. I'm trying to get it, and they keep saying, oh yeah, it'll be there by the end of last year. So yeah, that's one of the issues, is just like the frontline tech support really has no connection to the, uh, 
to the folks way up at the top of Comcast who are actually doing this. Yeah, I mean they did they did change our modems last year. I think largely in preparation for this. That was that. Although also giving a fabulous speed up at the same time, which was great. What community or where do you work? I in Boston, in so in the Back Bay. Comcast su surprised. I mean, as much as people complain about their service, and their, their customer service, their IT and their sort of network management has been excellent when it comes to V6. They've been one of the first ISPs to roll out V6 to consumers, yeah. um, and they have actually done deployments, but not in Boston. Not so um, the technical details we're going to talk about for a minute. Um, I have, I'm also a Comcast customer. I live here in Cambridge. Uh, I've been waiting for V6 native transit from Comcast. And um, there's effectively two things that you need. You need your modem to support V6. And if you have a DOCSIS 3 modem, that has that that's DOCSIS mandated, 3 I'm pretty sure. You have to support has, IPv6 has V6 if you have your DOCSIS 3. But more importantly, the box at the other end of your cable line has to support V6. And the uh, boxes that Comcast rolled out, whenever they rolled out their network in the Boston area, do not support V6 yet. And so they may be replacing your modems in preparation for replacing the, whatever they call them, you know, in the central offices, but in Boston area, not, they have not started that, uh, that process yet. Um, one of the slides I have in here somewhere uh, mentions the statistic that 50% uh, of their CMTSs are ready to go, or actually greater than. Obviously, we're not it. Awesome. Yeah. They do only do a 64 uh, delegation, which is a little frustrating, even in, in areas that they are giving them up. I was under the impression that they were aiming at 56s at some point. Maybe they changed their mind. <laughs> yeah, I haven't heard of anyone getting it. Hmm. That would be too bad. Because yeah. that basically means at home, I'm at. Um, I'm curious why you say that. I mean, what, what, what do you need a 56 for? If you want to sub-delegate, if you, as long as you have a site that only has one network, you're fine. But for instance, if you share networking between two people in the same building, and you have one residential connection, and the other person has a different router, and you want to be able to give them their own subnet, you can't give them a, a, a 68. You have to, you only can go. Yeah, basically you can you can subnet anything smaller, but 64 is one subnet. Um, and in my case, I have two, uh, namely my wired subnet and uh, my wireless subnet. And for fairly straightforward reasons, I'm not bridging my wireless onto my wired network. I trust my wired network a fair bit more. <sighs> ah, so this uh, covers some of what we just did. Um, religion. Purists, pragmatists. Uh, personally, I'm thinking in the long run it's going to be DHCPv6. Extending uh, route advertisement for the enormous number of things that uh, and that uh, DHCP knows how to do. Can I configure my NTP servers, etc., etc., etc.? I just don't see that coming out of uh, route advertisements. There might be some hybrid mode where you use both. Uh, that's supported, but that seems like a lot of moving parts. Um, so there's something kind of sort of like uh, RISC-1918 for IPv6. Um, there are ways in which you will be told, no, 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 this is not RISC-1918. I've never quite understood the arguments beyond you're not supposed to map this. I suspect that might be a you're not supposed to map. Um, so they did a clever thing in that they gave 40 bits of uh, Make, uh, please use this randomly. Um, and while I don't have the math in front of me, they basically intended it so that if you followed the algorithm for random allocation uh, of, a sub, of a subnet out of uh, this space, you could go through a large number of mergers and acquisitions without ever colliding with the networks of your acquired mergies, etc. Now, we'll see how well that actually works in practice, given the human propensity to make up addresses like uh, FD food, food, food. But, uh, eh, you know, you can't really control that. Um, there is a registry out there, if you Google around, 
where uh, you can register your uh, unique local address just as a hint that please don't use this, I'm using this. Um, and 40 bits is a fair amount of, of space for a random number, but we'll see what happens. This is what IPv6 looks like, or what uh, DNS looks like in IPv6. Uh, you know, at least at the level of raw uh, DNS zone files. Um, that's home. Uh, that's the reverse DNS for it. Um, this bit being my actual delegated prefix. I have actually already once or twice changed this uh, bit string as I changed upstreams around. Um, and I didn't have to change this at all. And, you know, I have more that are much noisier looking, but uh, <sighs> yeah, that's one of the hand ones. Um, one of the things I can mention as far as dealing with this ridiculous bit string um, is that any major DNS tool, like host for instance, or dig, if you ask it for an address forward in the obvious way, um, like 2001 db8 colon colon, it will spit out the reverse for you. And you know, copy paste that rather than trying to type that. Oh, so here's what my home network looked like. Um, this is an old slide, um, but it's still basically accurate, um, where it splits in two. Um, I actually embed those uh, VLAN numbers in my addresses just because it's kind of becoming a common practice. Um, don't know why I really used uh, eight and nine other than I wanted to skip a little bit of the low ones because I've seen vendors do screwball things. And uh, I'll mention that, you know, V4, V6, they both look like this. They don't have to, but uh, you could. Um, back in uh, 2007 or whatever it was that I uh, first turned it up, I was a little surprised as I did it. I turned up the, uh, the tunnel to the provider. Um, I turned on route advertisement with nothing actually configured on the machine. I assigned an address to my wired interface and every machine on my wired interface decided to start talking v6 immediately. Somehow you just even though they tell you it auto configures itself, you don't really expect it the first time it does it. Um, one good trick for dealing with a deployment is that when you first give connectivity to a host, it's only going to use it outbound. Nothing is going to be able to find it inbound until you start uh, putting DNS in for it. Um, and I wasn't willing to trust things initially, but uh, as I played around, it came pretty clear. My V6 connectivity works. Here I am several years later. I still haven't removed the uh, quad A records. Um, so when it comes to getting yourself connected, um, you really, really, really want to use native if you can. We are getting there. It's actually the case that uh, my employer, for instance, I mean, especially at the more commercial level. So my employer, for instance, the last two providers uh, were able to deliver V6 to the door uh, for a mere request. Um, we are actually starting to do so now, if only to make me happy. Um, I'll mention that uh, if you can get native and your native's cogent, you might want to think twice about that one. Cogent is not willing to peer with a fairly large number of people, including Google. Um, and this will cause you uh, all sorts of grief. One of the few cases where my wife noticed IPv6 was when she went to uh, Wonderground, which had just listed its cogent-based IPv6 address, which wasn't reachable. Um, and this is what they're doing. Um, so failing that, static tunnel providers are the uh, <coughs> obvious thing. Uh, Hurricane Electric, if it works for you, works here, obviously. Um, but does require Hurricane Electric. Hurricane Electric's tunneling requires that you can pass IP protocol 41. This isn't something you can typically do when you're behind an app. Um, unless you control the NAT and you know, set, that as a, set the, that as a DMZ host or something like that. But uh, if you can't get that, Hurricane isn't going to work, which is too bad because they're lovely. Um, are you going to talk more about V6 behind a NAT? Yes. Um, so, a question about, uh, or a comment on the tunnel. Um, I recently set up a V6 tunnel at work. We have um, 
Verizon DSL in Boston. Mm -hmm. They don't provide V6 at all. They have no plans to. And um, when I set up the Hurricane Electric Tunnel on a nice, simple Apple Airport uh, router that services 20 users, um, all of a sudden, all the Gmail users started complaining that people were hacking their email accounts. That sounds and, lovely. And it turned out that uh, G Gmail has a nice security feature that sees, oh, you don't live in Ashburn, Virginia, and yet you never <laughs> logged in from Ashburn, Virginia. Why are you now suddenly connecting from this end? Because our V6 traffic is routed through our in Electric's uh, server, uh, tunnel server in Ashburn, Virginia. So something to note that not all providers understand geolocation, that typically geolocation done by IP address does not totally work properly, does not work correctly with V6. It's getting better. Um, I can't remember what most of the typical geolocators think of me uh, these days, but certainly, yeah. At once upon a once upon once upon a time, I was in Telhouse in Telhouse at uh, New York, um, and I know it's gotten better than that. And just the clue is propagating. The clue is definitely not all there yet. Um, so, uh, getting back to tunnels. Um, 6XS is a uh, alternative to Hurricane. They're more European, but uh, they have pops everywhere. Um, and their tunnel system can deal with things like map traversals, roaming. Um, I haven't really tried them because up until pretty much right now, uh, I haven't needed them for anything. Um, now I'm running into uh, a place where I can't get anything else. Um, and so, if you want, I'll report back when I actually get to the point of configuring the tunnel up. I believe they sent me mail uh, at 5.30 or so saying, yeah, okay, you're ready to go. Um, I've been using 6 for about a year, it's uh, worked pretty good. Yeah, I can easily believe. Um, yeah, that, that, that was one of the things that was really wonderful. I was also really happy with uh, the Hurricane Electric Ashburn, Virginia one from uh, Amazon EC2 in Virginia. Two milliseconds or so. You know, it don't get much better. Uh, so one of the things that uh, uh, other tunnel methods I've used is six to four, which at this point is officially deprecated. Do not use unless you know what you are doing. Um, and the people who provide the service that a six to four user depend on are becoming fewer and fewer every day. It's too bad, I kind of like six to four. Uh, it was very easy to use as far as if you knew what you were doing, click a button or two and six to four connectivity. But uh, one of the big things that it suffered from was that there was no dead tunnel detection in it. Um, and Microsoft, and I think maybe uh, Apple's airports shipped with it on by default for a while. And this caused a great deal of grief. Um, there were statistics reported at something like that at uh, some point that 80% uh, of 6 to 4 con uh, connections fail. Um, and as near as I could tell, given how wonderfully it worked for me, this was entirely because, well, you turned it on in a place where it can't possibly work. And there was just no way to uh, detect that that was, pop that was so. Um, and finally, another one uh, that I kind of like is Teredo. Uh, Trado was cooked up by Microsoft. It's another fairly clever means of uh, getting an IPv6 tunneling. In the case of Trado, it uh, traverses NATs very nicely. You only get one address, though. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been using it at work off and on for those times when I need to talk to something at home that is uh, IPv6. But now that I'm turning on native, that will probably go away soon. <sighs> So uh, let's see here. Um, I've already talked about some of this. Uh, Hurricane Electric has the nice property that uh, if you want, they'll speak BGP with you, at least for IPv6. Um, I've never tried it, but I get the impression it's literally click, click around on their website a little bit and maybe not even go through an approval step and they'll talk to you. Um, they'll give out slash 48s to you know, anybody who is warm and breathing. Whereas, so 6XS, uh, just discussed, um, the main thing I can offer about them is that uh, they're a bit more bureaucratic, and by the, uh, I mean that as in, 
Hurricane has done a lot of things for me over the years where I just go click on their website and it's happy. Um, 6XS usually wants you to tell them a little bit about yourself and uh, you'll have to wait for a human to actually look at what you do. Um, and then they'll get back to you. It's a minor thing, but you know, it's a noticeable difference. So this is a trade again. I couldn't find a good picture for it. Uh, or rather, I could find low, uh, small pictures that would not blow up to a screen uh, this size at all well. Um, it does clever things. One comment about the previous slide. Uh, you know, the uh, uh, is only offering 64 prefixes, or some pops. Well, uh, the Watson pop, uh, I've got 48 prefixes right now. Yeah, it's definitely pop dependent. Basically, 6XS's model is that they don't actually do anything, do this stuff themselves. They talk to other providers uh, who set up pops for them. I don't know exactly how it works, but there's some amount of uh, how much is the provider willing to give uh, to 6XS Tunneline. At least that's the impression I've got. Um, and it's certainly great that you know our local one has 48. I'm looking forward to trying it. Um, so this Happy Eyeballs was not in place when my wife ran into her little issue with uh, Weather Underground. Um, it is now. You can find it in any major browser. Um, it's a user friendliness algorithm that's basically designed to try different connection methods in parallel and with a, perhaps a little bit of waiting in there to decide, well, who wins, how do I talk? Um, it's good because, well, the user gets what they ask for as quickly as possible. It's bad because sometimes you're trying to figure out what's going on and happy eyeballs isn't easy to, uh, to bias one way or the other. There are knobs to turn it off completely, like, you know, about config in, uh, in uh, Chrome, uh, but, uh, or Firefox. But I haven't run into too many issues with it, uh, honestly, beyond I look in the uh, little bar in my browser that says, what did you use to talk to this? And it sometimes flips back and forth for uh, things like Google. And that is another one of the things that uh, seems to bring out a lot of religion in uh, IPv6 land. In general, you take any kind of network protocol like this, or just thing that isn't quite real yet. Boy, you get some crazy religion. Um, you just manage to sometimes drift away from, I'm just trying to get this done. Um, so, bring up NAT in any kind of IPv6 related forum, <clears throat> a lot of people will come out of the woodwork to yell at you. Um, but that said, you can get it if you need it. Your vendor is happy to sell it to you. Uh, for example, the uh, Juniper routers that Work has, they're happy to do it. Um, I'm pretty sure I've seen it in Linux, but I haven't actually had to configure it, so I don't know. Um, there are some clever things you can do in this, that, and the other situation to try and avoid using that if you want. Uh, one of the ones that's becoming popular is addressing your hosts out of both uh, global addressing and Ula where ULA lets you provide things like ISP independence. So if you move uh, to a new ISP, you don't have to renumber your internal addressing. You also have the promise that because that's your internal addressing, it's not leaving the building. But it's not magic. Um, uh, one of the reasons you definitely want to be using NAT at home, at least for the IPv4, is that Everything out on the internet can't connect to any of my devices unless I explicitly enable it on the router. What's the substitute for that in IPv6? You have the firewall. And the firewall is just like there, easy to configure on whatever is talking to your modem? Well, I can't speak for your firewall, but I don't have too many issues with mine. And that's really the essential thing that makes your NAT go anyway, is the fact that it's not letting that traffic in because it has no state cable entry for it. Mm -hmm. um, which is, they'll know, substantially resembling a, uh, what a firewall does. Yeah. The only thing that's different about, uh, about the NAT is that, in theory, there is no reachability of uh, your home subnet from the general internet. Your provider is presumably not going to route 1042 to your house. You hope. Well, that's probably true. Can you speak to what you're actually using for firewall? I'm use presently using uh, FreeBSD's IPFW, 
works all right. Um, I've also used uh, OpenBSD's PF. It had a few more quirks where, well, they both have quirks. Um, IPFW's quirks are actually not so much quirks in dealing with IPv6 and not even in IPFW. It's the traffic shaper doesn't deal with a couple of corner cases in IPv6. Things like, I have to tell the traffic shaper, link local addresses, they're good. Because if uh, those go through the traffic shaper, they don't come out. Um, but the firewall itself is straightforward. I remember uh, PF having a few more quirks that were actual quirks. Um, oh, that's, uh, what was it? It wasn't stateful quirks. I don't know. There was, it was a few years ago now. They've probably gotten better. Um, no, so, um, are you talking firewall just on your host or on your router too? Well, that was a question of, you know, my nominal router, which is also a host. Um, at least that was my answer. Um, I haven't written a lot of firewalls for IPv6 yet, just the uh, particular one that was in front of me. So, you know, PF and IPFW. Um, so, a couple of examples of things that NAT isn't necessarily going to fix for you, or lack of NAT is not going to fix for you in IPv6. Um, I've done things where, for instance, I have two service providers who uh, come into a box and then a bunch of subnets behind it uh, that are privately addressed for you know, myself, for work, whatever. Um, that particular application where you then selectively choose which ISP am I going to go out of um, and deal with if traffic comes in on this one, make sure it keeps going back out that one. That one is not going to work very well for you in the IPv6 purist. No solution, at least at that level, has been proposed uh, to it. There are, are, of course, lots of people working on this very actively, but in a very different place. Um, that isn't it. Um, so, there is this tool that comes into play when you start having lots of source, ad lots of addresses available to you. Um, in that if you just have one address, and the guy you're talking to has one address, it's pretty easy to figure out, well, what addresses do I use for source and destination? In IPv6, where you have a whole bunch of them, it becomes much more important to pick uh, the addresses that are doing what you want to do. Um, and you could run into this in V4. I used to run into it all the time because I was always building crazy networks. Um, but it's much more prominent in V6 and there's a closer to a solution in it for it at this point. Um, Linux and all of the star VSDs have a uh, implementation of this table that lets you control how source and destination address selection works. I have actually hacked it uh, once or twice now where uh, at work uh, with that Teredo client on my desktop. I really didn't want it using IPv6 unless that was the only way to get there. Teredo works, but it isn't amazing. Um, so I flashed it up. It did what I wanted. I was happy. Windows has an implementation of it too. I don't know how recently, probably Vista and Grainer. Um, but the tables for it are supposedly not beautiful. I can't say that from experience, but that's supposedly what it is. And so as I said, when, when you start dealing with uh, networks where everybody has lots of addresses, being able to control address selection is really important. I used to have things like LD preload hacks that you could uh, load dynamically into an executable to bias what are you going to connect to. Um, i love to see that go away, because it often didn't work. Um, yeah, so this is a privacy address slide. Um, I think we pretty much covered it, um, although I should explicitly point out that uh, it's the default on Vista and uh, OS 10.7 uh, and available on most of the major free things if you turn it on. Um, I'll also mention personally, it just really bugs me. Um, <laughs> but I'll admit that one is a uh, character flaw. You know, I have this thing where I log into a machine, I see a long bit string of where I last logged in from that I don't recognize. It makes me nervous. Oh, this is just something I threw in for giggles. Um, so in both V4 
MV6, really any kind of uh, shared medium, uh, address discovery algorithm, you will run into uh, basically, uh, it's pretty hackable. You can attack it pretty uh, readily. They are fundamentally uh, built around trust. Um, and uh, I've even run into situations where, well, I kind of had to be a bad guy for a little bit. Uh, many, many years ago now, uh, when I was on Comcast, they apparently managed to delete their DHCP database. Um, and so, served me an address that was already in use by somebody who had presumably asked for it just before they had deleted the DHCP database, leaving us where neither of our networks worked very well. So I hacked up a little program to go attack our and make sure that I won the race with the, with the other guy when it came to getting the Comcast router to believe who was who. Um, and well, when you have 64 bits, that really is enough to do public key crypto games. And supposedly this has been done at least in the lab where you can secure our neighbor discovery. There were proposals to use IPv6, uh, IPsec to do this, but um, it was also pretty acknowledged that they wouldn't scale. Um, there's supposedly a Linux implementation, but like I said, I've never played with it. I don't expect to anytime soon. Oh, and this is how I end up memorizing addresses. Um, so, in theory, IPv6 is just a big bit string, no structure. But in practice, there tends to be. Um, so, for instance, this is an address at my house where uh, the 2001 portion is a block you'll see over and over and over and over again right now because it's one of the main ones that Aaron is allocating from. Um, the 470, you'll also see a lot because Hurricane Electric is very common and, well, 470 is Hurricane Electric. Uh, 8917, that's a short string of digits, that's me. Eventually, I see 8917 enough, and I'm going to remember 8917. And the nine was uh, something that I actually picked. Uh, that was the VLAN number that you might have seen on an earlier slide. And then there's the 64-bit interface ID. I have yet to memorize one of those. God help me if I do. Uh, I think I'm running out of slides. So this is how uh, Torito encodes its addresses. Uh, basically, you have this big long bit string, you can pack stuff in it. Six to four did similar things, where uh, there's a prefix that's allocated to Torito, then it embeds a Torito server, which is a magic piece of the architecture. It's kind of like how in Skype or any of the nat modern NAT traversing things, you need a host somewhere out there on the internet to, to help you get past the NAT. Um, it will do things like uh, ask you, please open a connection to this guy over here so he can send you something. Um, there's a bit of randomness in there just to help prevent address attacks, uh, guessing them just off the top of your head. It's not great. There really isn't enough space for that, believe it or not. Um, and then the address that the client is actually uh, coming from. And Torino uses this to figure out uh, where to send things to. Ah, I was supposed to put that in earlier. So, in IPv6, they basically did away with ARP as it was traditionally done. Um, they came up with an ICOMP protocol that uh, <laughs> does the function instead. Uh, because of the various features in IPv6 that weren't there in IPv4, they were able to deal with things that otherwise would have been circular in IPv4. Uh, things like you can use link local addresses and multicast. Uh, and for the most part, you don't really notice that it's different. You know, you type NDP A instead of ARP A or whatever it's called in your operating system. Well, you know, addresses, MAC addresses. Okay, move on. Um, but uh, a couple times now, I've written firewall rules and forgotten. Oh, yeah, ARP is an ICOM protocol now. And then 10, 15 minutes wondering why nothing worked. <sighs> so I believe I'm out of slides at this point. Um, questions, anyone? Um, I have to figure out how to frame this. I don't want to sound like I'm being completely pessimistic about it, but uh, and uh, if I'm going to, say, help go to my friend's house and help them set up a network, they've got nothing right now, they don't know what they're doing, one thing that I can do right now with IPv6 is I can go to Micro Center, buy a home router, 
uh, erase the OS on it, install Tomato Linux, and literally have the network up and running in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's 25 years of experience behind what I just said. Mm -hmm. It's mostly not my experience, just other people made magic sauce for me and give it to me in this nice free software, and I don't have to think about it. When do we get there with IPv6? It's going to be a bit. Um, and we're going to bleed all over the floor in the meantime. <laughs> Um, that's one of the problems here is that we are now hitting the point where we are pretty much out of address space. Um, and people are starting to stack up games to figure out, well, how do we make this thing work while, you know, packing the addresses tighter and tighter. Um, and as you saw from that slide earlier on, you run into folks like Comcast where no way, no how, they do not fit in any available address space and they can't play too many clever games because some of these things are transit networks and will cause issues or overlap with real IPv, uh, IPv4 space. I mean, just there isn't a lot of room left in getting anything done with IPv4. And that's really one of my big motivations in all of this is the longer this takes, the more time, the longer this takes, the more it's going to hurt. And the more we play with it now, get ourselves familiar, see, eh, it's different, it's not that different, boy, that part really sucks. We're more likely to get there soon, where we need to be sooner. Um, and that's kind of what I'm seeing, you know, across the board. I mean, I'm not the only person who can tell you something like this. What's going to be done in IPv6 to avoid the, uh, the kind of silliness that resulted in having so many IPv4 addresses going assigned to places that weren't even going to use a fraction of them. The main thing is blowing up the address space so big that uh, it's going to take a bit. The, among the original proposals, I'm trying to remember the exact numbers, but basically there was a compromise in here <coughs> where 64 bits, I think 64, it was, uh, the conclusion was 64 bits would be enough to make this go for a fairly long time. And somebody at, uh, somewhere in the process said, given how bad we are at predicting this stuff, just double it. We can afford it. Don't quote me on the exact numbers. I think there was an issue where they figured 68 bits mm -hmm. would cover everything. But they wanted things to be power of two also. Yeah. There are also things like we need <coughs> this many bits for global routing this many bits to address hosts. We need this many bits for subnetting within things. And, and didn't you say in one of the slides that there's like entire huge spaces of IPv6 that are carved off for, oh crap, we screwed up, we need to start another scheme? Most of it. Yeah. So like, we can let this run for decades and then say, okay, let's start allocating addresses in a different way. Yep. Is there any, is IPv6 being carved up in the way I think before was among various national authorities? That gets into international politics. <laughs> um, I can't tell you the big picture, but I know that basically 2000 slash 3 is the, this is the only thing we are allocating from. Exactly how that's carved up, I can't really tell you. I haven't paid uh, attention to that level of detail. But I do know that uh, in certainly in IPv4, notions like uh, sovereign property start coming up. Boy, I'm glad that's not my job. It's just complicated. I'm pretty so, sure that Aaron and Afnik can, are, are similarly have their own chunks of space that they, when an ISP needs space, they go to them. So there are separate chunks for each one of the major continental registries, but yeah. It's, and they're all using a very small fraction of the whole space, and nobody thinks they're going to run out of that small fraction anytime soon. Yeah, the basic rear system is still intact, and uh, they're operating pretty similarly under established policies where just the numbers are a little bigger. <laughs> a lot bigger. Just a bit. Okay, so the, I, uh, if I understand what you're saying earlier, the, uh, uh, when, once you get your initial connection off of the first machine, uh, you're recommending that you should be V6 over just, uh, just IRA? 
No, that was more of a, I suspect in the long term, that's the way things are going to go. I mean, at my house, I'm entirely slack. I don't have any DHCP whatsoever. It's only very recently that I have anything in the house that even knows what to do with it. Um, suddenly, 50% eh, of the house knows what to do, do with it, given recent hardware acquisitions. But it hasn't bubbled up that high on my list yet. But uh, DNS uh, doesn't really work well with the area? Well, I just do the standard thing people do if they're dual stack, which is you DHCP over v4, it gives you DNS addresses, um, and you slack for, uh, for IPv6, and you already have DNS, don't worry about it. It works, but, well, I do intend to play with DHCP sometimes, too. Okay. Um, uh, so with IPv4, um, when you're running servers, and you might potentially have a problem with abuse or you spam or something. You can have an IPv4 blacklist. Mm -hmm. um, with IPv6, especially if anyone doing any kind of spamming probably has at least a 64 subnet allocated to them, they can trivially choose random numbers to spam from. So you would need to do like at least a slash 64 blocklist to block this. And in reality, like even a slash 64 blocklist, I don't think will fit in RAM. Oh, you're not going to enumerate the... Uh... Yeah, but it could... Be, uh, so it's, it's harder to reason about. A 32-bit block list, you can fit in RAM, like in a worst-case scenario. Well, in practice, what people have actually been doing for this, and there are reputation systems that deal with IPv6, um, you just treat it more like a routing-style problem, where you drop an entire prefix in, and algorithmically it scales just fine, because you're just storing the prefix in a tree. Yeah. That, uh, that deals with it well. Do you know a library or anything to do that? I know I just saw NetBSD or, or commit a uh, library to do exactly that. Uh, the general term is patricia tree. Um, uh, Radix tree is another common name for the same idea, uh, or at least related idea. Those are, those are the two that uh, drop off the top of my head as far as algorithmically how you deal with prefixes. So can, can you, um, you know, start flipping your house, like, so if we start from an IPv4 house, you know, just turn it on for one machine and then add a machine and add a machine and have it build v4 inside the house behave well? Say again? Like, like, so to start playing in v6, like, can you, uh, does it work smoothly to just have one machine with v6 and add some more to it while the rest of the house still behaves nicely? Well, one problem that uh, does show up the binary answer to your question is yes, but one problem that does show up is, so the auto configuration mechanism in IPv6, and this is a huge bug, um, works at the subnet layer, uh, at the level of subnets. You turn it on for an entire subnet, and if it turns out that, well, there's one host on that uh, subnet, and it really needs to be there, and it doesn't play well, you lose. Um, one of the things I'm actually, the plan I'm doing at work right now is basically that I'm going to turn on uh, V6 at uh, the border router we have, and then I'm going to statically configure my desktop, and maybe a couple of others because we have a couple of guinea pigs. Um, I'm not going to turn on any of the auto configuration whatsoever because, well, we have work to do, not to bug IPv6. Um, realistically, I don't expect it to actually be a problem when we do get there, but I see no reason to rush. Okay, thank you. Oh, one more question. Um, so I, I can think of a lot of reasons why it's interesting for some devices to have multiple IP addresses, but presumably in IPv6, if I understand correctly, every device would have essentially a sub. Why is that interesting? Well, giving it a subnet, per se, isn't interesting. Uh, the sort of things that I've run into are you give it multiple addresses, not subnets, where you have multiple web servers on the machine, say HTTPS ones, so you can't just do the standard V hosting trick, um, and they need to work. Other things I've run into are things like this address gets treated by a very different routing policy further into the network. Um, basically. Addressing is how you uh, ask for different things from the network and differentiate A from B. But I mean on a client system, right? Just a regular endpoint, maybe mm -hmm. an IPv6 phone, 
or it might be a you know, laptop of somebody who's not writing you know, multiple VMs or something like that. Well, when my laptop is on such a network, for instance, um, I have two addresses, which is my uh, global one and the link local one that I don't really have any reason to not want. Um, and it will actually, uh, well, it won't really use the link local in most circumstances. The main thing is that uh, a lot of things just are biased towards using it. I mean, you could go without it. Do, do running advertisements use the link local? Probably. I don't remember uh, not having my sniffer on them lately. But I mean, a lot of that network control stuff is all link local. And the, uh, the ARP equivalent is link local. You were, you were talking about um, behind the net, so uh, I'll just tell you my, my story. I have a tomato router, you know, flash some Asus box, installed tomato on it, uh, and was said, hey, let me try out V6. So I have my Linux box uh, inside, it gets a um, static IPv4 address. I set up the router uh, advertisement uh, VM on it, and I was shocked to see that it actually worked. Uh, the IPv4 address of that Linux box is, you know, a, is a 10 something. So mm -hmm. it's net, fully natted. And yet I was passing um, E6 traffic. And I'm, you know, I set up the Hurricane Electric Tunnel, etc. But mm -hmm. I'm curious, you're saying that it's because my, I'm thinking my router passes um, the certain protocol number that's separate? Yeah, so uh, IP protocol 41 which is an IPv4 protocol 41, is the protocol for, there's an entire IPv6 packet in this. So it shows up on that uh, protocol at your router, it de-encapsulates the inner IPv6 packet, forwards it inside. The, I mean the V4 because it's a tunnel. Yeah, so, so you have a V4 packet uh, on, on the internet, it arrives at the router. Um, which uh, you then de-encapsulate the IPv6 packet within it, and then you forward that natively over the internal Ethernet. But my tomato box is not running v6. I must have missed a bit there. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so the one the one trick that I had to do is when I set up the tunnel on my Linux box inside my network. You know, in my network. Oh, oh, oh. Are you using a DMZ from No, it's not, not a DMZ. The, the one trick was I had, you know, you have to you have to specify the servers, the tunnel server's IPv4 address. So you put in the Hurricane Electric server. And you have to specify your client's IPv4 address. The yes. external address. Oh. And I specified my router's address. And so somehow, I guess, the router sees that, that as just a regular NATed connection, and it seems to work. But I was surprised that inbound traffic well, depending on exactly how uh, your router deals with uh, that particular IP protocol, um, it certain—I mean, uh, the DMZ approach to it is certainly the usual way you expect that. But I could easily see your—I mean, the other one where uh, you can get that sort of behavior very trivially is doing one-to-one -one that. Which publications would you recommend for? IPv4 network text you need to transition to six. I just read around a lot. Um, I don't have anything like at the specific publication level. You know, I'm very much a fiddler. Um, if I get something that gives me a vague idea and I'll just start banging on it. Um, the tunnel provider website. Say again? The tunnel provider website. Yeah, they certainly have a lot of education material. An enormous amount of education material. They are one of the bigger pushers where basically uh, Hurricane Electric has sort of gambled, uh, gambled the farm on we're going to make our, we're going to be the IPv6 guys and we're going to convince you to help us. Oh, I was going to answer the, or I was maybe going to reply to that question, how did the uh, tunnel packet get through? If you're a local client on your Linux machine and try to make an outgoing connection on that port, if there was a daemon, it might have tried to prime or uh, they tried to like, basically nap punch for you. Well, it's actually an, it's an IP level protocol, and the handling of those tends to be a little different. Um, I mean, vendors can do anything, but 
typically, it's very common for them to get dropped on the floor just as the default. Right. Um, if you want to do that, tunnel IPv6 through a NAT, uh, you can do it with OpenVPN now has uh, full IPv6 support, including prefix delegation through the tunnels. But then you need to have a server, I don't know, a service provider that's public that offers prefixes, large prefixes for OpenVPN. But if you have a server with a lot of IPv6 on it, like a VPS somewhere, then you can tunnel it all through. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.